All right, guys. Uh, quick review of the Byzantine Tang and Song Empire here. After the fall of Rome, uh, the western half of the empire lay in the hands of different Germanic barbarians. So the capital will move over here to Constantinople because it's protected on three sides by water or by mountains. And so this will be the prosperous half of the empire, the Eastern Empire or the Byzantine Empire. And why are we going to keep this as the capital? Well, number one, it's safe. Right? We have all of the trade routes um, uh, are going to connect here. It's closer to the source of money. It's safe. It's protected on three sides by water. And again, it's closely connected to the trade routes of Africa, Asia, and Europe. And so a lot of the rich, wealthy people from Rome move to this area. Later emperors are going to add to its strength, making it a city difficult to capture. It will hold out against the Islamic invasions until 1453. And so the new Roman Empire um, has a strong centralized government, kind of like the Roman emperors of old, like Julius and Augustus Caesar, a dominant monarch. All right? Now, similar to a sister empire growing, the Byzantine emperor will be head of both church and state. All right, church and state will be intertwined. So they are able to appoint people who work for the church, something that simply just does not happen in the West. So while we're doing that, I think my batteries just died. Um, the new Byzantine emperor, however, can be a very difficult job. A lot of emperors were assassinated. But the Byzantine emperor... Um, you know, the Byzantine Empire gets a big head start. It already existed because of Rome. So while it technically is its own empire, it had an enormous head start or, a no or an enormous leap forward. A lot of the hard work was already done. And one of the big emperors we want to know about is Emperor Justinian. This is when the Byzantine Empire will reach its height. Justinian tried as hard as he could to take over the entire Roman Empire, um, the eastern part, and recapture the western part. He wanted to become a new Caesar, but he couldn't do it, and it financially almost drained his empire. Um, so within 20 years, he realizes that even his best generals can't get this work done. And Justinian is the greatest empire reigning for nearly 40 years. And what makes Justinian so good was his wife, Theodora. Um, she worked as a dancer, uh, shall we say, until she was noticed by the emperor. She was significantly younger than he was, and they get married. And Theodora is seen as kind of the brains and the backbone behind Justinian's rule. There was a rebellion going on, and all of his advisors said, you need to flee. And Theodora grabbed a sword and said, well, if none of you will do it, I will go and do it myself. And it's his wife's insistence that he stay, that she's going to go put down the rebellion herself, kind of spurns Justinian into action. Now, she was quite not only a political advisor, but she was an ambassador and went out and set up trade treaties with as far away as the Sassanian Empire in Persia, but she also was an advocate for women's liberation, and she opened many hospitals and schools in her um, area. And unfortunately, she dies about halfway through Justinian's reign, most likely from cancer, and when she dies, Justinian kind of falls apart, so to speak. He's not the vibrant, active emperor he once was. One of the good things that Justinian will do was issue the Corpus Juris Civilis, the body of common law. And the Roman Empire was so, so full of many laws, 
Some of them were contradictory. They canceled each other out. Which one do we listen to? So he had his scholars and advisors sort through them. Find the contradictory laws. Separate them out. Find laws that stand alone or outdated. Let's sift through them and pick the ones we want. And it's done in a series of volumes known as the Corpus Juris Civilis or the Body of Common Law. This is how we are going to govern and how we are going to run the Byzantine Empire. Now, because he is who he is, he picked the strongest and laws that augment his powers as the one he wants to keep. And so absolutist monarchs from him all the way to Louis XIV are going to use the Corpus Juris Civilis because it helps an emperor's um, power. So... We're going to skip through some of that. And um, Justinian is one of the guys that will sponsor construction projects. Um, he will sponsor this 14-mile wall that will protect the inner part of Constantinople. And he will also build aqueducts, courts of law to hear people's cases throughout his empire, and even schools. He wanted an educated bureaucracy to help him govern. And one of the most impressive things that Justinian will have built will be the Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom. It was a beautiful Byzantine church with its more rounded type dome that will be transferred into an Islamic mosque in 1453. And one of the things that's going to cause a problem are these things right here, these frescoes or mosaics, paintings of holy images. But we are going to um, get to that. One of the things that is going to hurt the Byzantine Empire um, after Justinian is the plague or the Black Death is going to break out. Um, it happens several times throughout world history, but in the mid-500s, it hits Justinian's empire pretty hard, killing up to about 10,000 people a day. We'll get to that when we talk about uh, the uh, Middle Ages. Um, so, um, da, da, da. Oh, mm -mm. now, one of the things that's going to happen as a result of the Byzantine Empire is the expansion of trade between at least Eastern Europe the Middle East, and all the way to China. The Byzantine Empire will be an economic superhighway. Uh, unfortunately, because Western Europe was trapped into the Dark Ages, they did not tap into this revolutionary period of economic and cultural exchange. And that is because the Eastern Orthodox Church will be different from that of the Western Roman Catholic Church. In the Byzantine world, the emperor, in our case Justinian, is going to be the head of the church and the state. He will appoint an assistant known as a patriarch to look after the church. In the Western world, that job is done by the pope. And the church will control the laws of its followers. In the Byzantine world, some things are different. The church, not the pope, will define and control the lives of its followers in the East. In the East, priests could marry and have children. In the West, they could not. In the East, you could use leavened bread for communion, not unleavened or, un or bread with no yeast in it. And the big sticking point is the use of religious icons. Emperor Leo III said there can be no statues of Jesus or Mary or Joseph or any other saints because that is an example of idol worship. Now, possible, possibly this was due to Muslim pressure in 753, but praying to saints, asking Mary to help pray for you 24 hours a day was a deep, intensive practice in the West. When the Byzantine emperor outlawed this, both he and the Roman Catholic Pope excommunicated each other. 
This will lead to what is known as the Great Schism. In 1054, a battle between the popes and the Eastern Emperor will result in the permanent split or fracturing of the Byzantine Church and the Roman Catholic Church. In 1090, there was a hope of reunification when the Byzantine Emperor was forced to call for help recognizing the authority of the Roman Catholic Pope, Pope Urban II. And he asked for help in getting rid of the Muslims who were knocking on the door of Constantinople. Pope Urban will launch what is known as the First Crusade. It is the first and only, or at the First Crusade was the only successful crusade. However, the European knights behaved so badly in the East, they was, I call them Crazy Cousin Eddie. You're the hillbilly cousin or family member who shows up for the holidays that you hope doesn't come. And the church fracturing is uh, last till the current day. And the Byzantine Empire, however, will be a repository of not only Greco-Roman learning, but Hellenistic learning. When the West falls into the nastiness of the Dark Ages, the Byzantine Empire preserved that Hellenistic learning. It's transmitted to some of the Arabic scholars. That learning is preserved and kept alive and will be retransmitted westward after the Crusades. Um, and it is at this time an extension of the Byzantine Empire will cause the rise of Russia. Here in this giant flat land we now know as the Ukraine, I call it the world's largest field. We have these flatlands and prairies running down here. And up in the north, um, we get a lot of forests and woodlands and rivers. And Russia gives validity to the new term Eurasia, the combination of the continents of Europe and Asia, um, because Russia spans both of them. And the people known as Slavic people, Russian descendants, Indo-Europeans, will settle around the great city of Kiev around 7, 800 to 800 AD, right in the middle of the European Dark Ages. And at this time, they will mix with Vikings from Scandinavia who have this flexible boat that's able to penetrate deep into the heartland of Europe, and they begin to trade with the Russians. And Russian and Viking culture blends in this new beautiful city of Kiev that has an economic link to the city of Constantinople. In 860, the Byzantine emperor will send missionaries to gain converts. And in order to help the people of the area understand the Bible, the Eastern Orthodox Church will use Cyrillic writing. All right? Here is our alphabet laid out. And above it is Cyrillic writing, all right? It doesn't look anything like the same. The Eastern languages like Greek, Russian, use a different Cyrillic writing style, but it was written so that people could understand it. And not only builds unity in the Byzantine Empire and Russia, but it allows Christianity and literacy to spread um, as well. Things are going fine until Genghis Khan's Mongol hordes will arrive, the empire of the Golden Horde coming across Asia. And some of the Muslims will convert, or some of the Muslims, some of the Mongols will convert to Islam. And a branch of them will go up into Russia where they are known as the Golden Horde because the golden roofs or domes of their yurts give off this yellowish glow. And they will be in Russia for 250 to 300 years. And after the Golden Horde conquered you, they kind of ruled fairly. Um, and as long as you acknowledge them as your ruler and you paid them taxes, you were good to go. And this helps kickstart another branch of the Silk Road as Russian merchants now have access, they can plug into the Great Silk Road coming from China. 
And this allows to be an economic superhighway and another path of the Silk Road. Now to collect taxes, the Mongols used the Russian nobles, known as boyars. And the nobles will collect taxes for the Mongols, and then they will keep some for themselves. They'll skim off the top, and they will found the beautiful city of Moscow, where they will build the famous St. Basil's Cathedral, the head of the Roman Orthodox Church. Now, in the 1300s, with the Mongols so far away from their power base, the Russian princes will lead a rebellion and drive the Muslims out of Russia. And the guy behind this was known as Ivan III or Ivan the Great. And the Mongol Empire was safe, right? They said a fair maiden could put a pot of gold on her head in Russia and walk all the way to the Pacific Ocean and not get, um, not have to worry about being harmed. Well, all that is great, but we want to get rid of these pesky Mongols. So Ivan the Great, who will reign for about 50 years, is the driving force behind Russia's climb to power. And he will learn from the Mongols that the best way to govern is without the nobles at all. And he tries to do everything himself. He cuts the boyars out. And because he marries the last Byzantine um, emperor's niece, he can claim royal authority. And so he will claim the title of Tsar, meaning Caesar, the leader of Russia. And he will be worshipped on the equivalent of a divine right being. I am here because God wants me to be. Unfortunately, Ivan the Great will have his grandson, Ivan the Terrible, who will reign for about 50 years. And he will cut out nobles of all types and run the government himself. And he began to get rid of the boyars and reward loyal servants with land. They are vassals, one who serves, like a Japanese samurai. And they will get land in exchange for military service. He is the guy that starts classic feudalism in Mother Russia. And when Russia hangs on to feudalism, they'll keep it longer than anybody else. In the middle of his reign, around 560, Ivan begins to get sick. He begins to act strange. He loses his hair and teeth. He begins to grow these big knots on his head. So to cure that, his doctors prescribe him mercury, which is supposed to be the cure-all, but it makes him even sicker. And so he begins to, to form a secret police, and he unleashes them on all enemies, even real or imagined. The Nazgul from Lord of the Rings are patterned after his black-clad riders. In 1584, he will mercifully die in some aspects. Um, and while you think this is going to be good for Russia, it leads to another period of civil war called the Time of Troubles. And there will be an internal civil war until 1613 when the Romanov dynasty will be founded by young 16, 17-year-old Michael Romanov, a dynasty that will last until the end of World War I. Um, and so some of the great cultural achievements, um, the Russians build the beautiful onion dome of St. Basil's Cathedral. It looks like a, like a candy cane or ice cream land house. And the Russian Empire stretching from the Pacific all the way over to the Ukraine, the world's largest single country. And that, guys, is a quick AP review of Mother Russia.